Okay. I'll call to order the regular meeting of the Board of Education, which was duly noticed on October 8th, 2021, through posting and notification of the press in accordance with Wisconsin 19.84. So first we have the pledge, and we have uh, Commissioner Millard introduce it. Um, good evening. Thank you, Board President Murray, or Myers. <laughs> <laughs> Slip of the tongue, Kevin. Sorry about that. <laughs> It's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Kristen Moisen, the principal at Jackson Elementary School. She is in her 12th year as a principal and her 29th year in education. Kristen received her bachelor's degree in special education at Eastern Illinois University. She is certified to teach special education specific learning disabilities, emotional behavior disorders, and intellectual disabilities. She is also certified to teach early childhood special education. Kristen has taught special education in Illinois, Iowa, California, and Wisconsin. I'm fogging up here. <laughs> Kristen began working for the school district of Janesville in 2001. While working for the school district, she received her master's degree in education leadership and curriculum and instruction from Cardinal Stretch University in 2003. Kristen has also held various positions in the school district she has taught special education at Adams, Lincoln, and Washington Elementary Schools. She has been a program support teacher for special education working at the district office. She developed the beginning of the P4J program, the first early learning coordinator. She was the district Title I coordinator working out of the Learning and Innovation Department at the ESC. 2010, Kristen became the principal of Jackson Elementary School. She did both the P4J coordinator position and the principal position until 2013, <clears throat> excuse me. In 2016, Kristen was awarded as the principal of the year. In 2019, she was a Crystal Apple Honor Roll recipient. During the past 12 years, Jackson Elementary School has received several recognitions while Kristen has been the building principal. They have been honored for seven consecutive years as a Department of Public Instruction School of Recognition. They have been designated as an Imagine Learning World Class School in 2014. They also received the Imagine Learning Super School of Innovation and Blended Learning in 2016 and 2020. Kristen is extremely proud of her Jackson Elementary teachers and staff who continually strive to provide the best education for Jackson students. She believes that all children can learn and grow when given patience and kindness. Education is the pathway for children to thrive to be successful. When children develop <clears throat> excuse me, positive relationships in a loving environment, we see students succeed. Kristen is honored to be represented of the School District of Janesville and Jackson Elementary School as a building principal. Uh, who do you have with you tonight, Kristen? I have what? Delighted to introduce Elijah Smith and Violet Rosberg, who are both fifth grade students at Jackson. They've been coming to Jackson since they were in P4J, <laughs> and they are very good at saying the Pledge of Allegiance. So I'm very okay. proud of them. Great. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Kristen, I'd like to thank you for your help with this, and also um, your secretary, Robin, thank you very much. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, first I need um, a motion to adopt the uh, Board of a, a Education agenda. Okay. That's okay, so I have a, a motion by Commissioner Ardry and a second by Commissioner Murray. All, right. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, great. Safety message. Kathy, can you identify that John is on? Oh, thank you so much, yes. Um, so just a... Uh, Make sure everybody understands that we do have Commissioner Hanawal here in um, in our meeting, but he is here participating by phone. Thank you. Okay, safety message. 
Good evening, everybody. Last week was fire prevention week. Did you set me up for this, Denise? Is this, <laughs> is this a coincidence? Yes. Uh, a, a simple but a very important message. Change your batteries and your smoke detectors at least twice a year. Usually it's, you know, when we set the clock, change your battery. If you don't have a smoke detector, go get a smoke detector. Uh, smoke detectors are proven to be one of the single most things you can do for you and your family for safety in the home. It's, it's really that simple. If you don't want to change your smoke detector now and twice a year, like I don't know if anybody has ever experienced this chirping at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm sure you're very happy to change it at 3 a.m. Or if you don't have a battery, right? So just do yourself a favor, get a smoke detector and change your batteries. It could save your life. So that's it. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Our, next on our agenda are the student presenters. First we have from Craig High School, Charlotte Mark. Good evening, um, members of the school board. My name is Charlotte Mark, um, and I am the school board representative for Craig High School. I'm a junior, and I am very pleased to be speaking with you all tonight. In addition to student council, I'm involved in other extracurriculars, including varsity tennis, varsity palms, as well as clubs like DECA, Interact Club, and Link Crew. To begin, we recently welcomed the class of 2025 to Craig. They were led by our link leaders on their first day and participated in teamwork activities in small groups to help make their transition to high school easier. This year, students were also introduced to advisory every Wednesday. Much like prides from previous years, students in all grades meet in assigned classrooms for 20 minutes once a week to discuss any important announcements or events. In terms of student life, the year has already had some significant events. For example, students endured the wind and rain to see the Craig varsity football team defeat Parker in a 27 to 23 victory. In other sports news, freshman Raya Ariazola and senior Allison Brund both qualified for state for the girls tennis team. This tournament will take place at the end of the month in Madison. Craig students were also able to participate in homecoming week. Before the week began, student council members decorated the hallways for their respective grades and themes. The junior class's student council also organized a Red Cross blood drive last Thursday. They had 80 donors, 73 of which were first time donors, and the blood do donated could potentially save 177 lives. Last Friday was a busy day, beginning with the pep assembly, followed by the parade, powder puff game, and finally the football game against Wanakee. At the pep assembly, homecoming king and queen were announced with Gemma Thompson as queen and her twin brother, Tommy Thompson, as king. Gemma represented the Varsity Palm Squad and Tommy represented band. The homecoming dance was also a success as over 1,100 tickets were sold. This was about 200 more tickets sold in past years. This was the first school dance, not only for freshmen, but also sophomores and many juniors as home as a homecoming dance has not been held since 2019. In upcoming events, conferences will be held Wednesday, October 20th and Thursday, October 21st with no school that Thursday or Friday. The end of the first quarter will be October 28th. To conclude, I would like to thank the school board. I'm very grateful for this opportunity and I look forward to sharing more information on the Craig student body in the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlotte. Okay, next, we have Kaylee Conaway from Parker High School. Welcome, Kaylee. I'm Kaylee. I am a junior and student council president at Parker. I apologize in advance that this presentation is going to be lengthy. My classmates and I are grateful to be fully in person, which I think we can thank to you guys and which means we no long, longer have to wear pajamas and a Zoom, and we can wear them to school <laughs> after snoozing our alarms one too many times. <laughs> but most importantly, we're back into participating in some more normal high school experiences. 
This year, Parker welcomed 17 international students from seven different countries, Belgium, China, Colombia, Germany, Italy, Spain, and Switzerland. Our student council planned and organized set up a fantastic homecoming uh, two Fridays ago. We worked hard to put together a pep assembly, a parade, and a dance, and it was very fun since we didn't get to do it in the past years. Adventure Fayed went canoeing down the Sugar River through Sweet Mihana Campground and will be fishing at Track Through Park tomorrow, hopefully. And I have worked with the fishing club of retired gentlemen out of Milton to get donations and help with preparation. We have rescheduled our trip to Riverside Park for Monday, October 18th, where we will be playing leisure outdoor games and having coordinated instruction for pickleball, shuffleboard, horseshoes, and Friends of Riverside. In early November, we will be going to the Janesville Bowman's Club to receive archery instructions and shoot bow and arrows. Parker Decca kicked off the year with an ice cream social. The ice cream social brought members together and allows the officers to highlight activities for the year. Parker Decca is excited to be volunteering with community partners again. FFA Fall Leadership Workshop was held in Marshall. On September 27th, the conference is the official start to the year for members to gain knowledge about FFA, spark ideas for events and activities to bring back to their chapter and promote FFA to others as well as collaboration, confidence, and leadership skills with themselves and the organization. The FFA advisors meet during the conference as well. We receive information for state and national FFA and our section's FFA alumni. We discuss ideas and issues brought to us from the state and national FFA as well. The Parker Arts Academy, during their first year, with starts with Clue on stage, which will begin on the 29th. No, it's not. It's this Thursday. Um, the comedic the comedic who done it based on Paramount Pictures motion picture Clue in the Hasbro board game. Clue will be laughing and guessing all night. Directed by Megan Burkhart. Clue on stage will be presented on again this Thursday in Parker High School in the PHAS Auditorium. All tickets are fifteen dollars except for opening night when the tickets are twelve dollars. The Parker Arts Academy will follow up Clue with a holiday favorite, White Christmas, with a cast and crew of over 50 students. This classic will be sure to get the holiday spirit up. Tickets go on sale for that November 1st for the December 3rd through 12th performances. Student and parent-teacher conferences will take place next week on Wednesday, October 20th from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Thursday, October 21st from 8 a.m. to 12.30 p.m and 2 p.m. from 7 p.m. Conferences will be virtual, either by phone or video. Parents will receive an email with links for t each teacher to request a conference. They can contact Parker High School if they need assistance. There are more important events from the music department coming up. There's orchestra concert next week, Tuesday at 7, and a choir concert next week, Wednesday at 7. The Parker Band will have their chili supper on November 7, 11 a.m. through 6 p.m., not only will you be able to get some yummy chili, but band members will be on hand to provide entertainment. And finally, if you don't find yourself downtown through the end of October, then you will be missing out on the Brodacious Brews to view some pretty fantastic artwork created by Parker students, so you should check it out. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to move on to citizen comments. Before we do that, I have got an announcement to read. <clears throat> uh, welcome to all those who have signed up to speak to the board tonight. We value your input and interest in our school community. According to, uh, accordingly, through school board policy PO0167.3, Titled Public Comment at School Board Meetings, the Board allows citizens an opportunity to express interest in and concerns for the schools during the citizen comments portion of school board meetings. 
We'd also like to remind you that school board meetings are for the purpose of carrying on the business of the district. They are not public meetings, but official business meetings held in public. To ensure that board meetings are conducted in an orderly and productive manner, all comments, all public comments, no matter the topic, are subject to the following regulations. Number one, time limit. Speakers will be given one three-minute opportunity to address the board. This time limit will be enforced. If a speaker continues past the expiration type, the school time, the school board president or district official will ask the speaker to stop and leave the podium. Per board policy PO 0167.3 adopted on March 9th, 2021, the portion of the meeting during which the participation of the public is invited to speak shall be limited to 30 minutes unless extended by the presiding officer. Number two, conduct. Speakers must conduct themselves with respect and civility toward others. Participants shall direct all comments to the board and not to staff or other participants. No person may address or question board members individually. Prohibited conduct includes conduct which is disruptive to the meeting, interferes with the ability of others to observe the meeting or speak to the board, or interferes with the ability of the board to conduct business. This includes conduct which is abusive, harassing, or threatening, and conduct which includes the use of vulgarities or profanities. If a speaker violates this rule, we may prohibit the speaker from further comment at the meeting. Number three, topics for discussion. Speakers may not comment on confidential personnel disputes, share grievances involving individual school employees that do not implicate issues of public concern, or share individual student disciplinary matters, as there are other channels available that provide for consideration and disposition of such matters. Number four, board response. Pursuant to Wisconsin's open meetings law, board members are prohibited from responding to public comments unless the topic was identified on the public posting of the board agenda. And number five, recess and adjourn. In the event an individual's conduct causes a disruption to the board meeting and the board cannot continue its business, the gavel may be used to declare to recess or to adjourn the meeting. In addition, if such conduct constitutes a threat to the health or safety of another individual or individuals at the meeting, law enforcement may be contacted to restore order and safety. Thank you. So, um, we have, before we start, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that we did receive some virtual correspondence and that it's all been shared with the board members. So if you sent in a citizen comment uh, virtually, I just wanted to make sure you know that we did get it and we do read those. So thank you. Thank you for um, sending that in. Okay, first on my list, I think we've got about six or seven, uh, is... I, I think it's Colton. Uh, is it Messner? Messner. Okay. Welcome, Colton. Would you please um, make sure you give us your uh, name and address, please, okay. and, and mask, please. Oh. Thank you, sir. Um, my name is Colton Messner. Uh, I'm a junior at Kirk High School. Uh, my home address is 4241 Chadswick Drive on Wither off of Wuthering Hills, my mom's house. Um, other than that, can I get started? Please. Okay. You have the time. Uh, good evening, all board members. My name, like I said, is Colton Meisner. I'm a junior at Craig High. A good number of my peers and I would like to have a normal senior year. We can't have that with masks in our face. We can't call this our new normal. I do want to just point out numbers must be pretty good considering no school in the district has been shut down yet. As of yesterday, there were 918 active COVID cases in Rock County. In the, school district to, in the school district of Janesville today, there are 17 students and two staff members with COVID-19 in the district. Um, the hypocrisy is that we don't have to wear a mask in contact sports where we aren't socially distanced, but we have to when we are socially distanced. Um, I would like to point out that there is no mask mandate, county, state, or nationwide. It is a recommendation. I gather a lot of my classmates' thoughts and type them up. Please take the time to read the ones I don't get to. Don't get me wrong, if you want to wear a mask, you can, but it should be an option, not an order. I shouldn't get told by a teacher that I will give you a written referral if your mask is below your nose again when half the time the teacher's mask is not on correctly. 
At the end of this board meeting, you should all have a copy of the two pages of quotes I printed off for you guys um, from classmates at school that I get uh, quotes from them. I have four very short, very short quotes from the classmates that you as board members need to hear. End quote. These mass mandates are not effective at all, especially when we have a mass break at the beginning of each class. The student then went on to say, in some of my classes, I'm not even granted a mass break. I will buy by that by saying, I don't, one out of my eight classes, I get a mass break. One teacher out of my eight classes gives me a mass break at Craig High School. Um, I texted a very good friend of mine who supports what I'm saying, and he said, I do. I said, well, why haven't you talked to me and maybe given me a quote yet? Then he went on to say, because I'm scared I will get into trouble. Now, if you ask me, a student or anybody shouldn't be scared to voice their opinion, which is their right as all Americans. Um, this is me. Hard for us to follow this order that is district-wide when nowhere else we go outside of school requires a mask. Again, it is a recommendation, not an order. I do believe that kids are sick and tired of being sick and tired, and I was not brought up as I do as I say, not as I do mentality. Um, please make the decision that is in the best interest of not only the teachers, but the students of this district. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. And everybody, we got his, uh, the handout. Just want to make sure everybody got it. Okay. All right. Next is Laura Madison. Hi, Laura. Good evening. Good afternoon. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. I think it's Stevie. <laughs> <laughs> and would you give us your address, please? Absolutely. I'm Laura Madison. I live at 2206 Kellogg Ave in Janesville. Okay. Thank you. Are we ready with the timer? Okay. Great. All right. Um, I am here tonight in my capacity as president of the Janesville Education Association to speak regarding the mask metric proposal that Superintendent Pufal will present this evening. Last night, the JEA had a representative assembly, and during that meeting, we discussed and then voted if the JEA would endorse this mask metric. The Janesville Education Association does endorse and ask that the board approve this mask metric. A few of the reasons why the JEA supports this mask metric are, it is based in science and data. It is a plan that is structured so that we know what is going to happen. It removes the stress of uncertainty, which we have all felt this past year and a half. And as a bonus for the board, it will remove the need to continuously revisit the mask policy. It keeps our elementary students in masks until a low level of community transmission is obtained. Therefore, keeping the children who currently do not have the option of a vaccine safer. It also has a vaccine incentive, which we hope inspires more people to get vaccinated. We look forward to seeing a vaccine incentive for elementary aged children once that becomes available. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, next I have a Carla Herman. I do have asthma and last time I almost had an asthma attack afterwards, so. Um, I would like to apologize. I was a little emotional last time. I wasn't sure I was going to speak. If I'm quoted in the paper, please don't misquote me or quote me out of context. Um, my address is, my name is Carla Herman. My address is 4344 Edgeview Court. I would like to say thank you for letting me speak tonight. Um, as far as what she just said, where's the transparency? We did not get a copy of the documents for the new mask metrics. 80% COVID vaccines ain't going to happen in Rock County. Seriously, that's not achievable, and it's wrong, because that puts forever on masks. I've been watching the Rock Janesville Code vid dashboards in school districts. It's wonderful to see the Janesville numbers dropping down to 115, and there are only 17 active COVID cases in school, 19 including staff. And I realize you're voting on whether to extend the masks or not in our schools. I also believe they should be masked by choice. At least make it optional for the high schoolers, um, and that doesn't affect me. My kid's in middle school. I would also ask you and implore you to move your vote on this new mask matrix out for at least like two weeks or so and give the documents to the parents. We have a right to see what you're voting on. We do. We pay your salary because you wanted salaries. Um, 
We found out what it was because a co uh, one of your members actually bothered to call me today. So I don't agree with it. I can't be vaccinated. My daughter can't be vaccinated. How is that fair? Um, I'd like to do some positives, though, also. Um, we have had football games, middle school dances, and homecoming dances this past week where kids were not wearing a mask at extra school activities. So I'd like to know why there's masks during the day and not at night at school extras. I'd also like to give you two studies um, regarding masks. Half the, half the participants didn't have to wear a mask. The others had to. Of the half that were wearing masks, 1.8% were still infected. And the other half without masks, 2.1 got infected. There is not a huge difference when it comes to masks. Another study was where 54 school districts had mask choice versus 13 school districts in the same state who had mask mandates. Out of the 54 pro district COVID out of the 54 pro choice districts, COVID decreased 79%. In the 13 districts with mask mandates, COVID decreased 77%. Again, no huge difference. Yet we all know about the um, dangers that this causes our children. And I could go into that, but I'm running out of time. I do want to close or talk about some information from not only an American, but an internationally renowned medical institute, the Johns Hopkins Institute, where, and I will quote, said, believes that we've, we're done with the surges. What we may see is bumping cases, seasonally, depending on pockets of country where there's low immunity rates. And remember, breakthrough infections are real. They're going to happen. But they have downgraded COVID from a major public health threat to a mild common cold-like illness. This is the Johns Hopkins Institute. They have said perhaps it's time for them, meaning administrators, to start looking at the science of this. Masks do not do more or less. All they do is hinder our children. And you can find it online if you actually look about the dangers that's happening to our children's lives physically. Thank you very much. For your time. Okay. Uh, next I have Bill Mitchell. Bill Mitchell. Come on down. You're the next contestant. Right up here, please. Mr. Mitchell, would you uh, please state your name and your address? First of all, good evening to everyone. My name is Bill Mitchell. I live at 3731 Fairfax Court, Janesville. I am the grandfather of two children who are in the Janesville school system. The mask mandate is child abuse because it's intentional inflection of emotional distress and in violation of the Janesville School Board Administrative Regulation 5451.1, which states in part, all public school personnel who have reasonable cause to suspect a child has been abused or neglected shall make a child abuse or neglect report to the appropriate authorities. Well, within that same regulation is this statement. Abuse includes physical injury, sexual abuse, and emotional damage. What is emotional damage? Emotional distress, also known as mental anguish, is a non-physical and mainly psychological injury that may be exhibited by feelings of humiliation, shame, insomnia, depression, self-destructive thoughts, anxiety, stress, etc. The law recognizes emotional distress as a state of mental suffering that occurs because of an experience caused by the negligence or intentional acts of another. Now let's review the minutes from the board's meeting of August 24th. At that meeting, Commissioner Taylor, and I quote, said students spoke at the Milton School Board meeting last night and at the board meeting tonight and expressed feelings of anxiety and social isolation. 
Also at that same meeting, Commissioner Paul said, it is important to stay focused on the health of our schools and student academic success and emotional well-being. The school board must rescind the mask mandate, define emotional damage, and prove that wearing a mask does not cause or contribute to emotional damage as stated in the Janesville School Board Administrative Regulation 5451.1. And as the previous speaker mentioned, I would also like the board to wait for a vote on the mask matrix until all documents are available for the public to review. Okay, uh, next I have uh, Ty Ballerud. Is Ty coming? Hi. Mr. Ballerud, would you uh, state your name and address, please, for the record? Yeah, uh, my address is 4608 Pendleton Court, um, Milton, Wisconsin, Janesville, Wisconsin. Um, five three five six three. Um, you know, you got a copy of the letter to the Supreme Court today uh, that we sent. Um, also, your mat matrix is also listed in here. We asked uh, um, the superintendent to go ahead. We'll give that to Denise. Thank you. Um, you've seen some copies of uh, what National Geographic has come out, and they have stated that it, it harms uh, Kaiser or uh, uh, FISA Kaiser, uh, they're striking. So uh, healthcare, as far as healthcare, uh, we don't understand it anymore. You know, the first meeting, we used to have meetings where the, the uh, uh, citizens would be able to sit down and join the board. And that got retired out without ever out in the meeting, without ever a discussion invited to the public. And these pe pa parents, know what their kids are suffering. You know, I'm, I, you know, I can't, uh, you know, you, you can't, we can't, you, we're not gonna be able to cover that up. That doesn't go away until they stop suffering. And so, you know, uh, by putting more mask on or suggesting, you know, only the beautiful pictures, like the young man, I believe from Craig was saying, you know, we can see him on the wall out there. You know, the wall of excellence is the pictures with kids and adults getting together and making that work out, that's special. And with masks, we have no chance at that anymore. And, um, you know, I don't know if you guys read uh, Act 4 this year, but there's a timeline behind the scenes, and we don't all know how that's supposed to go, especially parents, and especially them young people that would join civics otherwise. They will, will not get a chance. They'll get a chance of a civil war. And, um, you know, basically 75% of the parents said we don't, we, want, we don't want a mask mandate. We want an option. You know, if somebody wants to put a mask on, they can. If they don't, they don't have to. And so, you know, at that point, um, if you follow the federal level at all, uh, they're talking currently um, uh, that the Board of Education, and we'll present a document to you guys tomorrow, um, our website, that there was five states that were sued originally August 31st, just a couple days after the vote here federally in four states that weren't named in the investigation now that are named. So if you look at them two con consistent, there's a constant investigation of litigation against the side that says, hey, why don't you prove on paper? Uh, you know, I presented before the vote the copy from the State Department of Health. They have no documents, and yet it, uh, it didn't change much. The school board has presented no documents. They continue to go on. Some of that is guilt because we're masking our kids. Thank you very much. Okay, next I have uh, Mr. Ryan Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, Claire Dish. Last 
time this moved on me. Can we turn me off? Sure, it's Claire Dish, 1717 Double Tree Drive. Jeez. Okay, so I would like to start with talking about masks are a waste of time, energy, and resources for our schools. With all the additional challenges our schools are facing with behaviors, our board should be focusing on how to improve learning environments for staff and students. The masks are found all over school grounds, both inside and out. They are found in toilets. They are purposely broken during class time periods to take walkabouts down to the office to get new masks, where in the next class period, the masks are broken again. Student Services has sent out an email saying they are up by 40%. Our kids are struggling in so many ways. And it has, it, the masks are really, they don't care. They don't care. Um, I know that an email went out seeking um, help from retired teachers. Well, I think that was intended to be a very positive idea. I think it said, really says something about what's going on in our schools right now. And people don't want to come in and they don't want to work. And that's pretty scary. Um, again, the time and resources could be better used in reaching out to parents in our community to get more involved. For example, this matrix system that's being um, presented this evening should not be voted on this evening because there should be an opportunity for all parents to read it and may have a weigh in on that decision and what that might look like for our kids. Parents have a right to know what this would look like. As of lunchtime today, when I looked at the dashboard, which I know is meant to keep us informed, it hadn't been updated since the 6th. I don't know how often that gets updated, but I am curious to know why it's not updated more often. Maybe, again, people just don't have time or energy to look into that anymore. Um, so with all of the bigger issues that need to be addressed within our schools and our community, TikToks and the oh my god those are terrible I don't know like things are being destroyed today alone there's um, hand soap squirted all over bathroom stalls there's chipped paint off of walls black marker on the outside of the school with inappropriate drawings um, I've seen broken sinks uh, broken uh, paper towel dispensers I, I mean it the kids are out of control and they we need help in the school um, and the masks, it's like if you're wearing a mask or not, we don't really, I mean, you're supposed, like, right, okay, it's a deal, I get it, but it really doesn't need to be the focus anymore. So I'm asking for us to be able to review the matrix before there's a vote. I would really prefer mask choice all around moving forward, and I would like us to focus more on the education and leave the medical decisions up to the parents. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you. That and citizen comment. Thank you. That's it. That's it. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on. Um, could I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Okay, whoa. Well, I got it from Commissioner Murray, second by Commissioner Ardry. Um, we're going to probably need to do a roll call vote because we have Commissioner Hanawal on the speakerphone. So let's take a vote. Hanawal. Yes. Hayworth. Yes. Herta. Yes. Millard. Yes. Murray. Yes. Paul. Yes. Ardry. Yes. Dahmershausen. Yes. Myers. Yes. Passes 9-0. Thank you very much. Okay, going on, we have a presentation um, about the sale program. All right, good evening. Uh, so I'm here to present uh, a little bit about uh, the SAIL program, but also about um, some of the information that, uh, and, and some of the leadership uh, strategies that our principals have been um, taking part in this year as they um, try to improve and as, as they serve the school district of Janesville. So thanks for 
uh, one, for the opportunity to, to let me inform you on some of the work that they've been doing, and two, giving them those opportunities um, to improve. Um, there we go. So uh, October is National Principals Month, if you didn't know. Um, if you read the article um, that Superintendent Pufal uh, put in your packet, um, that was in there. Uh, and I'll, I'll get to this at, at the, the end of my meeting as well. But so what I'm going to do today is go through that article a little bit and show you that some of the things in there, some of the domains in there, the four domains of this is principal leadership. These are the things that our principals are doing, right? And these are the things we're trying to do to help them improve um, so that they, they can get better each day. So while the, the number one uh, influencing factor in education is the teacher in the classroom, um, principals have an incredibly important, important job and influence 25% of what, of what happens. Everything from teacher satisfaction to their retention to student attendance rates to discipline rates, um, they have an incredible influence. And one of the things I, I, Janesville clearly does very well is we have some very experienced principals um, in this district. And that's pretty unusual. Um, so we need to make sure that we're doing our best to make sure that they're getting fed, they're growing, they feel like uh, they belong uh, because retaining and, and building principles is, is, is way better than, than having to have them cycle through. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what they've done and, and um, what we're going to do in the future. So if you remember in the article, the, the very first domain was engaging in instructionally focused interactions with teachers. And it breaks down into a few things, but one of the things I wanna talk about is educator effectiveness. So educator effectiveness is Wisconsin's uh, evaluation model for staff. And uh, this past spring, uh, all teachers and administrators were invited to participate in a survey that's been done for several years to get feedback on, well, what's happening in our buildings? What's the culture like? How do we treat each other? What's the evaluation like? What's my supervisor like? Uh, all, all sorts of things. Uh, what we did in the summer is took all those survey results that were given back to us from the state and got them back to our principals. Like, hey, here's what our staff think. Right? Here's, here's what they believe is going on in our building so that we could make educated decisions of how to improve any of that. Right? If there's areas that we're doing really well on, let's accentuate that, let's continue that. If there's some areas in our building um, we can improve upon, let's work on that. Um, all the principal, we went through, through that, principal shared this with their staff so their staff could also say, well, here's what we really meant right, when we surveyed that way. Okay? Um, so first part. Okay, uh, of, of what we're doing to help them be better instructional leaders. Uh, so we have talked about since uh, July instructional leadership and what that looks like. And you know, right now there, there's a lot going on everywhere. Right? Um, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of stress, um, but we also know that student learning is enormously important uh, and that folks are counting on us to make sure that our students are learning. So one of the things we wanted to do is, is get our principal saying, you know, we. I get there's a lot going on, but we got to focus on how can we better be instructional leaders so that our teachers can do a better job. Um, and the last part of, of this is, is professional learning communities. And I'm going to come back to that later. Um, it's, it, uh, it, it's a little bit of education speak, but um, it, does, it does mean a lot. And um, in education, we've uh, historically been uh, uh, what's called data rich and information poor, right? We've got a lot of, a lot of data, right? We don't always use that data to make informed decisions. Um, and it's one of the things that we're going to try to do a better job of uh, with professional learning communities and one of the things we've worked on pretty hard with our principals um, already this year. Um, one of the, se the second domain was building a, a productive climate. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on here because I, I think principals do a, a great job of this because they know the importance. Um, there's a, a, a saying that, that probably works everywhere, but it certainly works in school buildings that um, culture eats structure for breakfast. Right? You can have some great structures. Excuse me. Right? But if, if your culture isn't that great, it's going to be really uh, hard to overcome. So everything from how students are interacting with each other, how students and teachers interact, how administrators and students and teachers interact, um, our, our, our principals do a, a great job and are, are really intentional about this. So let's get to how this links with SAIL. So SAIL is a School Administrators Institute for Transformational Leadership. And it's been around for, um, this is what, it's the ninth year. Um, for this, and this is the first year that, that we participated. And we took all of our 612 principals and, uh, and uh, associate principals with us uh, for a three-day conference, uh, really to work on, you know, how can we, how can we get better and, and, um, 
you know, improve individually in our school buildings and then collectively be able to have those conversations together um, over a three-day period of time. So this is, this is cohort eight and nine. So red is, is nine. Um, it's a, it's a two-year commitment in sales. All right, so this isn't something that, oh, well, yeah, you know, Janesville's doing something and not a lot of other schools. This happens every year, right? This is, right, there's schools from all over. And I know some of the schools on this list have been there before, right? For many districts, it's, yep, every few years, we make sure our principals are getting fed, right? We're making sure that they're going up and making sure that they're focusing on, on what matters most. Um, so just to give you an indication of, of you know, who's there and who's, who's participating uh, this year. So what we did is uh, SAIL itself really focused on um, coherence. And the, the, the principals will even tell you it's a word we probably use a little more often now just because of it at the 612 level of, of you know, what's coherence mean. And we really focused on these four areas uh, in coherence in what it looks like in change and what it looks like in, in an organization. Um, and I'm just gonna read to you. So one of the things in, in the, the principal's profession development is they were uh, re required to do some reading ahead of time. And, and uh, the book we were required to read says, how do, you over how do you turn overload and fragmentation into focus and coherence? And it really was the, the leading, leading part of our time together and our focus is how do we do that? How do we do that individually in buildings? How do we do that in our teams? How do we do that with our leadership? And went through everything about um, what doesn't work very well, right, and what does work much better. And how can we focus on pulling on those levers that work, right, instead of pulling on the levers that don't work? Um, so while we talked about structures and strategies, um, that really wasn't coherence. It's important. But what we really talked about and what we tried to build in coherence is, is does everybody have a clear understanding? Are we really working with instructional precision? Are we really following the data um, is, is, is where we went. So um, that was, that was our, our introduction before we even got there. Um, so I'm going to go through the days, and I'm not going to spend a, a whole lot of time. I will tell you, um, the, the principals don't often get time like this, to just to sit and breathe and not have somebody sending them an email, not have the phone ring, not have somebody knock on their door, right? And so having the time that they could work together and really just focus without interruption and having somebody else lead them through that um, was, was really good. Uh, it's hard as a principal because you feel like you spend most of your day trying to fix things. People come to you with problems and your job is to fix them. Uh, and this was an opportunity for them you know, not, not to necessarily just look at, well, I gotta fix it all. Because you start looking at things, well, I, that could get better and that could get better. And, and I think a lot of our principals started looking at, well, I'd like to improve that and I'd like to improve that, right? Um, and as you all know, if, if your focus is everything, your focus is nothing. Um, and so what this conference, what SAIL helped us do is say, well, what's the biggest bang for the buck? What levers can we pull um, to really make that work? Um, so day one was really looking at um, big picture things. What's our data look like? What anecdotally do we feel about what's happening in our building? And let's start identifying a few goals and not just the goals, right? Because goals are great, but without strategies to achieve them, right? And individually achieve that goal, like what will work? That was day one, and it was work. Uh, I can tell you, and, I, and day, day two was, was worse. We were beat, right? It, it was a lot of intellectual work. Um, and for me, though, the highlight, uh, we went out to eat, and honest to goodness, I had the best bacon I've ever had, and so that just tells you everything is better with bacon, right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, we won't, probably won't go there ne ne next time, but that was, man, that was good bacon. So, and they said that too. They said, this would be the best you ever had. And they went lying. So day two uh, was a, a lot of work and they uh, developed a, started developing a theory of action, okay? And looking at, at survey results and data results. And uh, the word we were introduced to on, in day two was simplexity, okay? Which was really finding the smallest number of key factors to make the biggest difference. Uh, and and it's, it's something we worked very hard on. So the theory of action, real simply, um, for a guy like me, a theory of action might be um, if I make sure that I'm um, eating healthy and unprocessed foods and I work out four days a week and I'm making sure that I'm um, staying hydrated and I make sure that I'm staying rested, um, then my weight will decrease. So 
The theory of action is I can measure easily a day, well, did I eat right? Did I sleep? Did I hydrate? Did I work out? Right? I can measure that on a, on a real tight basis. Right? But measuring my weight daily could fluctuate a bunch. So the, the whole idea of leading and lagging indicators is one of the things I worked on. Like this is what we can see on a daily basis or a weekly basis. Are we doing this? Hoping, right, we have this strategy and intention that it will change something later on. So that was day two. Uh, and I, I mean, it, it was work. We, we, it, again, it was intellectually exhausting. Um, but it was great to be able to do it without interruption, and interruptions. And it was great to be able to do it collaboratively um, together so that, that people could ask each other questions. So our third day together um, was really um, looking at our, our, uh, articulating what this would look like in a 100-day plan. Not what it will look like in June. right? What's it going to look like in the middle of November? Right? Let's just let's just worry about getting that far, um, because one of the things that happened, and, and you know, I'm going to have Chris Lau share here in, in a little bit, is uh, we're all pretty stoked, right? We're up there saying, "Hey, we, we can do this, and we can do this, and we can do this," and you get pretty excited about all the things you want to do, right? And then you get back home, and some other things happen, and and you start planning for August, and all the PD you got to do, and you figure things out, and you're like, "Wait a second, right? Maybe." So the hundred day plan works great because it's enough time that we can look outward, but also not so much time that, that when, when we go back up, and we will go back up on November 16th as a team, um, you can say, you know what? Didn't work out quite like we thought, but we got a lot of things done. And, and I'll talk about uh, a lot of things we've gotten done already. So we basically built a 100-day plan that went from what are we going to do in August, right? What are we going to do weekly in August? What are we going to do on particular days in August? Well, we got a staff meeting that day. We had a PD that, that day. And that's how they built out their 100-day plan um, and really looking at, at a framework um, that, that I'll come back to. What's interesting is every single school we brought came to this in some way, shape, or form, is that we need to work on strengthening our professional learning community. And professional learning community is really built on three big ideas. They're really simple. We believe that every student can learn and achieve at high levels. We believe that, that we need to work together to do this, right? that none of us is as smart as all of us, and that we will look for evidence of learning and respond to that evidence. It, 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 it's very simple in stating. It's very complex to do. Um, so from a teacher level, all right, just so you're understanding, because sometimes in education we throw around things. People say PLC and professional learning community. I don't know what you're talking about. From a teacher level, it's real simple. It's four questions that are impossible to really argue with, right? What do we want every student to know and be able to do, right? How are we going to know, right? How do we know if they know it? What do we do if they, if they don't? And what do we do if they already do, right? Again, sounds really simple, pretty complex to do. Uh, but that's where all of them in some way, shape, or form, all of our schools landed on, we need to strengthen this in our buildings. Um, they did a great job building some planning because every building and every staff is in a unique place. So I'll go back to coherence. And uh, what all of them did is built kind of here. We need to work a little more on our culture. We need to work a little more about our, our protocols. We need to work more on making sure we have a clear understanding of what we're doing with um, discipline or literacy or whatever it is in our professional learning community. Um, and so they monitor that through their 100-day plan, right? And they monitor of hey, are we at this stage, this stage, this stage? And I can tell you, because I've met with uh, many of the teams already um, this year, is many of them have, uh, you know, we, right, because we're in education, right, we color code stuff, right? Got a lot of green, right? We got that done, right? We're where we need to be um, so far. So we're working hard on that. What I did is I took all of them together and kind of said, well, where are we working together as a district? Like, what's our, what's our some of our focuses? And so... When I meet with the 612 principals every month, it's one of the things we look at as a team, right? right? We've got five schools working here. We've got five schools working here. We've got four schools working here, right? Let's have some commonalities in what we're working on, right? What we're seeing, what some of the barriers are. And that's some of the work we've been doing to continue our focus with sales so that when we get up there next month, that we can say, you know what? We've, we've done the things we could do. Maybe we didn't make all the progress we wanted to make, but we, we've been working hard at it, and we haven't forgotten it, and, and it's still a priority of ours. Um, so before I go on, though, I, you've heard me talk a lot. I, I, I'll have you know, Chris kind of give his two cents um, uh, as, as a participant and, and some of the work that um, him and his, his team uh, did up there and, and what they've done 
sense. Thank you, Chris, and thanks for the opportunity to talk a little bit about sale and the transformation that it's made for us. Um, first and foremost, I think an untapped resource that we were able to capture is the use of our assistant principals. We do we spend lots of time planning and lots of time attending meetings and directing things, but we don't deliberately involve our assistant principals because they're working on discipline, they're working with kids, they're helping with families. And there was a concerted effort to really pull their skills and help us move our goals forward. So to have three days to plan with my team was a wonderful opportunity. Working through that process, we had the opportunity to look at our data, we had the opportunity to look at areas that we do well at Parker, areas that we need to improve. And we landed on three things. We know that we need to introduce our teachers to more high leverage learning strategies and have those be used in the classroom. Strategies that help kids memorize, strategies that help kids talk, work with content, engage beyond just teacher directing instruction. We know that our kids struggle to identify key ideas and details in their reading. We, that's a theme that we see through all of our standardized testing and that our teachers see in the classroom. And we know that our kids struggle to apply mathematical concepts to real world pro problems. So through our sale plan, we developed a 100 day plan to start to attack those needs. And that 100 day plan we brought back, we've shared with our instructional managers and they're our second line of help. They're helping share information, they're helping lead in service with their departments. And we come together regularly to look at data and have discussions about are we moving in the direction that we want to. The beauty of this is we've, all, we've had PLCs at, our, at the high school level for a very long time, but after COVID and after the needs of our kids, we needed to re-energize that. We needed to go back and really focus on data, really focus on collaboration, really focus on developing common assessments that we can use in the classroom and look at, are we meeting our goals? So our sale plan was formulated around achieving those things. The other beautiful thing is we have a school improvement plan every year. Our sale plan aligns with our school improvement plan. Each year, I and my teachers develop a, a student learning outcome in their evaluation. We have aligned student learning outcomes across the building, so we're all working on the same goals and we can have collab collaborative conversations about moving in the direction that we want to. So when Chris talks about coherence, this really truly does give us the opportunity to create coherence in what our goals are coherence in the actions that we're taking to achieve those goals, and also a unified understanding in the outcomes that we need that ultimately align to our district promises and move us collectively forward where we all want to be. All right, and the, the last bit, if you remember from your article, and for those of you who didn't get to your article, um, hopefully I've done a pretty good job of summarizing your article and just saved you some reading. Um, the last one was uh, managing personnel resources uh, uh, strategically. And uh, there's a few things we, we've, we've done that with, with this is, um, you know, we talked about your, your, you need to calendar your priorities. If you want to be instructional leaders, then you need to, to get that in your calendar that you're going to be in the classroom, you're going to be in collaborative meetings. Um, you're going to do the things that, that help you understand what's happening uh, with your data and with your instructors. Um, Tina's worked real hard on making sure the well-being of our staff and, and that um, our, our principals have the tools necessary to, to address that. Um, and it, giving our, our, um, our principals an opportunity and a chance to build relationships with, with all stakeholders, everywhere from, from students to, to teachers to, uh, to parents. So, 
Um, just another part uh, of things that, that we addressed throughout, throughout the year and have, have certainly addressed uh, since the beginning of this year. Uh, so the last thing I'll just leave you with is, is remember it is National Principals uh, Month. So if you get an opportunity um, to, to shoot them an email or something, I'm telling you, um, as a former principal, they don't get a lot of thank yous. They don't get a lot of attaboys. Um, so every little bit helps when, once in a while to just say, you know what, hey, I really appreciate uh, what you're doing. Um, I, I know they'll appreciate it. So I'm, I'm happy to take any questions if you have any questions. Um, I, I also know you've, you've got some pretty big stuff on your agenda. So. Well, thank you very much, and you're right that they don't get a lot of love. And so thank you to all of our principals. Let me just say that. Do we have any questions or comments, Commissioner Hayward? Yes, thank you for that. I, that was the first thing I noticed is um, National Principals Month. That I guess I need to call the florist tomorrow because, man, Dr. Bion, I work with her a few times a week um, with Craig PTO and that and Mrs. Fanning and all the relationships with Dr. DeGraff and Ms. Moisen and Mr. Lemire and Mr. Loud. Every, all the principals are so good. Um, any interaction I've ever had with any of them, and I know they deal with the good and the bad. And... Um, they are, do anything that we ask of them, and there's way more on their plate than what they need to have on there. So thank you for all the work that you guys do. Um, and, and gosh, Chris, what a big project for you in such a short time being here. It's a great thing to pick up and run with. Thank you for doing that. I love the uh, quote at the end about prioritize, put your priority prioritize your calendar not you know calendar yeah, yeah. your prior yeah. yeah um so this is really good i just want to make sure i understand because i think this is good work to come back to i'd love to hear how the 100 day plans come out um so this you said when we go back do you, do you have to you guys go back to yes. a retreat yeah so we'll go back on uh, november 16th and then we'll go uh back again um i believe in february we go back and we'll take our team back and and look at what basically in, on the 16th we'll set another 100 day plan okay and then we'll go back in about 100-ish days, yep. right? Not quite. Um, and see how we did. And that will kind of set the tone because then we'll go back for another three days in June. Wow, and, yeah. And and, um, and and look at things and and um, do some more learning. So um, it'll, it'll be really good. And, and you know what? It was a, it was a great introduction for me. Um, I got to meet uh, all the principals I work with. Um, it, it, it made a great first impression on me. It was a great introduction to the district uh, to be able to do that in June and a really, um, a really low key way for me to do it, right? I wasn't running the show. It wasn't me having to have everything together and it wasn't, um, so it was a great introduction and, and I, I'm, I'm really glad we did it. I, not just because I think it's been a good program. It was really good for me. So I, I appreciate the opportunity because, um, you know, Superintendent Pufal and, and, uh, Dr. DeGraff didn't have to let me do it, but, uh. So it was, it was great. And you got good bacon too. So, and I, yeah, um, let's not forget that. No, yeah, right? no, and I, I do, I truly do look forward to hearing back about this because I, I don't like the one, like you guys do such great presentations and we don't hear how it came out. So I'd love to, this is great work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? Any, anybody else? Oh, Commissioner Ardery. And I appreciate the preload of, under, well, not understanding, but at least reading through it. And now I'll state, I am sort of a transformational geek. A lot of my career has been in that realm. So the one thing to me that wasn't clear is what were we transforming kind of simply from to? And if there is a quick, you know, elevator, top, you know, view of that, I would love to hear that. Yeah, so I... I, I'll tell you, Greg, that really that got to be days three, three's work for, for all of those buildings of, um, it, it was, they called it a black box activity. How would you like to behave on November 15th? What would you like this to look like? And, and you had to come up with maybe three, maybe four, and then how are you going to get there? For everybody, it was a little bit different, which is why I said we have, we have like four or five schools working in um, maybe on, we need to strengthen our, our PLC structures. Like we don't have the structures, right? Chris was talking about, we need to look at data. Like we don't have protocols to look at data. So for everyone, it was a little bit different, um, but th there is some common themes. And, and I'll tell you, the, the professional learning community and the structures and the protocols is a, is a pretty common theme, 612, if, if that's helpful at all. Helpful. Helpful. Didn't... <laughs> Well, and of course now, and, I, and my bias is I've sat maybe here too long. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard a lot of the things that we're attempting to do. And when we say transformation, um, 
is it really a tweak? Is it really a tweak or is it truly transformational? Um, because much of what I've heard when we, when we say transformational in the educational realm, in many cases, is not really transformational. It's just we're being a little bit better than we were. So it ends up being tweaks. So as I think about, you know, not for my student, my kids, but for the other students, what's significantly different from elite from their school experience, you know, as they transition from one year to the next, or maybe it is one experience, elementary to middle to high, because that's transformational for them. Mm -hmm. um, but then educationally, what are we doing different? Obviously, not necessarily can't answer this question at the moment, but maybe that's a mindset or a thought to be able to answer as we go forward. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Commissioner Hanawal, do you have any? I don't want to forget about you. Do you have any comments or questions? No, thank you, Kathy. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Keep forgetting my mic today. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, at 3.2, we have a discussion and possible action on the WASPA Fall Region 13 meeting. Um, this is um, a meeting that uh, that um, where we need to decide uh, who we'd like to send as a voting delegate, and um, and then what do we what guidance do we want to give them once they get there? In other words, oftentimes in the past we have said uh, we will send this delegate unencumbered. And so um, so uh, there's that that we need to consider. Uh, I will tell you that, um, that uh, Commissioner Dahmershausen has been very active uh, in this uh, capacity in the past and, and has expressed interest in, in going back and continuing his work there. And so um, I would like to uh, entertain a motion um, for someone to attend and, um, and what do you want to, what kind of guidance do you want to send them with? I'd like to make a motion to send uh, Commissioner Dammerhausen to the state WASBA convention and have his vote be unencumbered. Do I have a second? I will second. Oh, there you go. <laughs> for, okay, so that was for, a... For new board members, can you explain what unencumbered means? Yes, it means that we're, we're leaving decisions on um, policies and procedures that may be decided uh, uh, up to the... We're trusting the, our representative to uh, uh, vote their conscience. Basically about these things. Sure yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you for the question, uh, Commissioner Dommershausen. Do you have anything to say? Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of add to it. It's a regional meeting. It happens in uh, every year. Region 13. There's 47 school districts involved. It's the largest region in the state of Wisconsin, and they pretty much. Uh, they usually have a workshop, but they brought it separately. At noon, there's going to be a vote on the regional director, and then the meeting will be in the evening. In, uh, and it's always at the Monte Carlo room in Elkhorn. Uh, it's kind of interesting to meet the people in southeastern Wisconsin of the other districts. I always enjoy it and that, and uh, hopefully I learn something from it and that I make... Uh, the only decision is the Region 13 director, and I am up for that. Uh, I'll be one, uh, uh, the incumbent. Uh, I won't get into it. Uh, she's a nice lady, and we'll leave it at that. But um, that's pretty much it. It is just regional, not statewide, like okay. we do in uh, January. Okay. And that becomes a different, different thing. So... Uh, anyone can attend the evening meeting that wants to. The one at noon will be virtual and that, and we'll be able to hear the candidates and we'll be able to hear any comments that any of the uh, 47 districts might have to say about anything. So I always find it enlightening, although I liked it when they did it all in the evening and that. So, uh, and the two candidates will be able to make the last minute speech, Great. whatever that might be if they so deem. 
that they'd like to. That's that's it in a nutshell. If there's any questions, I'll try to answer it. Okay, any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, then I'd like to call the vote. We're gonna need a roll call. Oh, I'm sorry, do you have a question, I, Commissioner I think, Arter? Well, not a question, but to clarify, yes. the motion was for the state, and this was really a regional meeting. Right. That's true. Oh. Get, a friendly amendment to say, was before a regional meeting. I, I'm good with that. Is your, Commissioner Hanawa, are you fine with that? You seconded it? Yeah. Okay. All right, good. Okay. Um, all right, let's go ahead and vote. We're going to do a roll call vote. Hayworth. Yes. Herda. Yes. Millard. Yes. Murray. Yes. Paul. Yes. Ardry. Yes. Dahmershausen. Yes. Hanawal. Yes. Myers. Yes. Passes 9-0. All right. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Commissioner Dahmershausen. I, I'm, I'm sure you're going to have a great time and learn a lot. Okay. Um, next on our agenda is the presentation and to consider the approval of the mass, mask metric. Commissioner, or excuse me, Superintendent Pufal. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, it's, it's good to have an audience with you tonight and uh, look forward to walking us through an option, right, for how to proceed um, in the, you know, the very difficult circumstance that we've found ourselves in now for um, 19 months as of tomorrow, March 13th, Friday the 13th, right? No, Friday the 13th, for me at least, that will live in infamy. Um, uh, when when we were notified that we were all going to be, you know, forced to go to virtual with virtually no warning and certainly with not the right training and preparation um, along with everybody else really kind of across the country. And ever since then, we've been trying to navigate this pandemic, you know, using common sense, using, using the science, getting input from people um, and, and trying to find our way um, that allows us to stay focused on our promises for our kids, right? And, and in spite of un, un, unusual circumstances, continuing to stay the course um, with using those promises as our decision-making guide. And, and I think we've, you know, we've done a pretty remarkable job of that. You've done a pretty remarkable job of that. We, we were able to stay open when that seemed really risky and a lot of other districts didn't do that, particularly the big districts. And, and we were successful in that regard. And, and throughout this whole process, decision after decision, we've used the best information that we've had at a moment in time um, to do the very best we could under the circumstances. And, and we've done that with the best of intentions. Um, we've, we've asked for grace along the way because we've been the first to admit that sometimes we were just kind of making it up as we went, right? I mean, if we're being honest, that's, that's, that's the truth, right? And that's what, what we've been doing and that's what everybody else has had to do too. And so we find ourselves, you know, at another one of those moments in time where we want to continue to learn from what we've done and continue to evaluate, you know, the circumstances we find ourselves in and continue to stay focused on using those promises as our, as our, as our benchmark for making decisions. Because at the end of the day, that's, that's really what's been serving us you know, really well throughout this whole process. So one of the things that somebody asked me about is, is what, what are we held accountable to? And, you know, we have a forward exam. That's the state exam that we take each spring. Um, state report cards come out, and a lot of that's based on the results from the forward exam along with other things. Those are the, the externally imposed accountability mechanisms. And then we have internal mechanisms, our promises, right, at, at the top of that list. And then we have district improvement plans, school improvement plans, which are driven by the promises. And at the end of the day, none of these things, none of these accountability measures include whether we wore a mask or not. Wearing a mask is a piece of 
of, of a series of layered protections that have been put in place based on health department recommendations and the CDC and the State Department of Health. At the end of the year, we're not going to get measured on how many days we did or didn't wear a mask. That's not going to be part of the report card measure of success. But whether kids can solve an algebra equation or that that third grader can read at grade level, those are the things that we're going to be held accountable to. And so we have to find a way to make sure that we're optimizing the opportunity for our kids to be able to meet those accountability measures. One of the things that I think we knew, but we really know now, right, for the vast majority of kids, the vast majority of time, they learn best when they come to school, when they're in person, in a classroom, physically with the teacher. That's what works most of the time for most kids. And so as we make decisions, we have to look at what are the things we have control over as a district? What are the things that are externally imposed on us that we don't have control over, but that impact whether we're in person or not in person? Lots of people are talking about studies, you know, the early studies of schools now. Um, there are two. Um, they're both out of big county school districts with tens of thousands of kids in Arizona. Why Arizona? Because they're one of the states that starts school really, really early compared to like Wisconsin, which is September 1st. And so there's a study being done in Wisconsin right now. I can tell you that UW Health is doing one, but it's going to take time, right? The early studies that were done in schools, K-12 buildings um, in Arizona, definitely showed that you know there was an increased likelihood of COVID spread if you're not masked. I say a lot more than that, but you know, just keep it at thirty thousand feet, right? Um, anecdotally, and again, I, I'm the first to admit this is anecdotal, right? In the state of Wisconsin. There's a potpourri of different things going on in different districts, right? Mainly around this issue of either being masked or not masked and var variations thereof. I can tell you each day I get a, I get a news reel. And it's just like the headlines. Anytime there's, anytime there's an article about education in any school district in the state of Wisconsin, in any town, um, I, I get a, you know, and then you can click into the link if you want to read the article. And some days there's maybe only 10 or 12, and some days there's 30. It just depends on what's going on in the news cycle, right? And so you look at those headlines. And I've been looking at those headlines for the six weeks that school's been open, and particularly the last month. And time after time after time, I'm seeing headlines on a, on a nearly daily basis of districts that started out not wearing masks, that have had to switch to wearing masks and oftentimes had to go virtual in between getting there because of the outbreaks that they had in their schools. And so that's anecdotal. There's no, that's not research-based, and so I'm the first to admit that, but you know, I'll look forward to seeing the research when CW um, gets it done. So what about, what about the district? What about the numbers? You know, you see those, those weekly charts. We update those, those, those uh, you know, statistics on staff and, and, and student quarantines and positive cases once a week, typically on Wednesday or Thursday. And to date, um, we've had, in the month of September, a total of nine staff. Because it's hard. You see those weekly data, like, like well, so what's the cumulative effect of all of that, right? So... Month of September, nine staff uh, with COVID. And so far through yesterday, five uh, staff, additional staff. These are unduplicated counts. So a total of 14 um, employees in the district who have been diagnosed with COVID during the first six weeks of school. Um, and you can see very few quarantines. Um, six total quarantines as a result of close <coughs> contacts um, with those folks. And what about the kids' side? 
so in the month of September, we had a total of 53 students diagnosed with COVID. Again, unduplicated count. Um, and I don't know, I have to do the math over there, 38 kids who were quarantined as close contacts to those 53. During the month of October, again, only through the first 11 days, we have 44 new cases of student COVID for a total of 97 so far during the first six weeks of school. We have 22 kids um, who were quarantined as close contacts from those additional 44 cases. And so I think if you add all of that up, it's 97 kids with COVID and 60 kids that have been quarantined as close contacts. Almost all the close contact quarantines almost always are a result of who was eating lunch with who. Now I can tell you that your plan has worked. Because what I can tell you with 97 cases, if we weren't masked, we'd probably be somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000 kids in the first six weeks of school. About 20 kids apiece, that's what it would be. Because if an if a elementary classroom has a kid in it, they're, they're together all day long, that class is going to get quarantined. A secondary kid goes from class to class to class, eight hours a day, plus lunch. And whoever's sitting around them in that circle is going to get quarantined. Those are not our rules. That's one of the things I think some people are really you know, unclear about. We don't make the quarantine rules. We don't actually quarantine anybody. The school district doesn't do that. The health department does that. And the health department has broad reaching statutory authority to make and enforce those rules. And we are obligated to cooperate with them by statute. And so I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, I'm, I'm really ambivalent about the great mask debate. I truly am. But what I'm passionate about is kids being able to come to school. Kids being able to be in the seat. And as long as the quarantine requirements that we have to follow from the health department are as they are, then we have to keep these layered protections in place, whether you believe in them or think they're the right thing or, or not. Because at the end of the day, it's what's keeping kids able to come to school. And I'm not going to stand here and tell you I can make it perfect for a kid who gets quarantined and deliver a high quality education to them. I'm not going to promise you that. Because I'm telling you, a teacher cannot teach the kids in front of them who are physically in school and then be expected simultaneously to deliver a quality instructional program to kids that are virtual because they're quarantined. We do the best we can. We're better at it than we used to be, but it's far from ideal. So, you know, some of you asked me to put together a metric. Um, because one of the things people have wondered about is how are decisions being made? When, when does this end? Like, when do we get to the, like, when are we masked and why are we masked or why aren't we? And when, you know, what, what, what are the, right? So um, I, I did a fair amount of research on this, worked with the health department. Um, the, the metric is laid out in really two parts. And across the top, you see the, the boxes, right? And those boxes represent transmission rates of COVID in Rock County. And it's based on a seven-day rolling average. And, you know, there's, different, there's four different spots delineated, ranging from low transmit, transmission to high transmission. And so what the metric says is that whether we're masked or not masked depends on the transmission level that's going on at a moment in time. If transmission is low down in the blue area, which is, by the way, where it was from late May into early August, 
then mask wearing becomes optional. If it's in the yellow range, the moderate transmission range, at the moment, we would make masking required for elementary and middle school kids because, again, elementary through sixth grade at the moment is not able to get vaccinated. High school kids are, and so we would continue to have masking optional at the moderate level. Uh, you know, I, on October 26th, uh, we're going to get some rulings about possibly making vaccinations eligible, you know, available to younger kids. This would evolve then, right? You know, once kids have a fair amount of time, you've got to give them a couple of months because there's a six-week process, right, from beginning to end. Um, but we'd evolve that box then eventually once younger kids, assuming that gets approved to being optional for all kids once they've had that chance to be vaccinated. When we're in the higher transmission rates, um, then, then we evolve to wearing a mask. Um, right now, we're in the high transmission rate. It's 225 cases per 100,000 is where we're at right now. So we're well beyond the 100 mark as we have been throughout the first six weeks of the school year. In addition to that, um, there's, there's also, so, so, so irregardless of vaccination, you know, there, there may be times where you're wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. And if COVID gets, you know, quiet, like it did during the summer, we, we would be mask optional, irregardless of vaccination. That said, vaccination does matter. Um, and, and when people say, well, we'll never hit certain vaccination levels, well, we're well north of 90%. For measles, mumps, rubella, polio, a dozen different vaccines that are in place and have been for, for generations. So there's a, there's a, I'll call it a vaccine incentive. Nobody's required to do anything. It's a choice, right? But if we hit, you know, the 80% thresholds for students and staff, and we're already in excess of that for st staff, we're at 93, 94%. Um, at any particular level, high school, eventually middle or elementary school, assuming approval, then all that stuff on the top goes away and we're permanently um, mask option. Because people are protected. It's called herd immunity. You hear that talked about in the news at least periodically. Smetric. Uh, was reviewed. I met with the health department officials. They're supportive of this. Uh, again, they say this follows good science. Procedurally, um, administration, specifically my office, will review the numbers. I review them every day, to be perfectly honest with you, but you know, I will officially review them um, on the 1st and the 15th of each month. We'll actually, you know, put a spreadsheet together that we can post on the on the web page if, if you decide to approve this. And so we'd be able to, you know, October, well, I'll start November 1st, November 15th, December 1st, December 15th. What was the specific level? That way people don't even have to go try to dig into the links to find the data. We'll make it super easy for them. Um, and we can keep people posted on what our vaccination rates are right now and put that all in one spot so that it's super easy for everyone to find and they don't even have to go searching for it. We really won't see, um, because, because the metric that I'm using, the database that we're pulling from, is based on a seven-day average, we're really not going to see us bouncing in and out of blue or in and out of yellow, like, what day is today? Are we, you know, put a blue flag up for the, the poll, or, right? Because that would get super confusing for people. Um, the way this is set up, because it's being um, assessed twice a month procedurally in the administrative process, and it's based on a, on a rolling average database, that has a smoothing effect, right? It takes peaks and valleys off, and it has a smoothing effect. And you're either trending down over time or up over time, or you're flat, and it, and it flattens out the, so, does, so it doesn't look like, you know, the heart rate monitor does when you hook up the EKG, right? And so for me tonight, in, you know, kind of in closing, you know, my recommendation is that we approve the metric. Um, why? Um, 
I, listen, I don't like wearing a mask. I take my mask off anytime I can. I, I hate wearing this mask. I do. But what I hate even more is kids not being able to come to school. And so as long as the rules that we are required to follow for quarantine and close contacts are as they are, I implore you to consider approving this metric or keeping masking in place in one way, shape, form, or another. All right, I have a motion from Commissioner Millard and a second from Commissioner Herda. Now we have a motion on the floor, and uh, so discussion, questions? Mr. Donner I, I have one that's a little, it's a little off, but I don't know where else to get it in there. Uh, I like this. I like this very much. Uh, I'm not trying to avoid the responsibility of the decision, but it gives us clarity, and it gives us some time for the public to hear it in that, and uh, discuss it and talk about it. And I think most of them should like it. I hope they will. But the one thing is I'd like to look at in the future, could we put a sign at the door and on the desk, please wear your mask properly when you're in here? Because that is a school district thing. And I don't want to, I don't want to be mean or anything else to people. And there are reasons if you have asthma and you can't do it, there are shields to wear. Wear the shields. It'll help. And that there are there are ways around it, uh, so I'm just hoping maybe we could encourage that more with something like a sign at the door and on the desk. Please wear your mask when mask wearing is in effect. I don't know how to quite word that, but I'm sure we can come up with something. So anyway, I support it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions, Commissioner Murray? I might need some help from our attorney, but I'd like to uh, make a motion to amend Commissioner Millard's motion to table this discussion until the next meeting so that the public has an opportunity to see uh, what we're talking about. When is our next meeting? Two weeks. Is table the proper word? I hope so. I keep forgetting my. Is table the proper word? Uh, I would say either table or suspend. Um, would be either the I think so. I think, yeah, I mean, you're tabling it to the October 26th. Is that, is that the motion? Correct. October 26th. Okay, so we have an amendment to suspend or whatever till October 26th um, and we have a second we, we we have that recorded right we know who's this okay great okay just want to make sure um, so let's discuss the amendment comments questions so quick question yes um, with respect to the as the motion sits here implementing it effective October 29th if we vote in favor of it on the 26th, would it still be implemented on the 29th? Or do we need some time or, I wasn't exactly sure the, the time difference here, so. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're trying to, because you know, this is a little bit of a different approach, right? And so we're, there needs to be some communication and education, um, you know, around, um, around that issue. And so it's very difficult to do that well uh, with short time frames. And so obviously, will we make it work if that's what you decide? Yes, but ideally, uh, a, a bigger on-ramp would be helpful. Okay. Commissioner Murray? I guess I'm looking at it, well, one is for more public opportunity, but two, that's two weeks. The data, knowing there's rolling averages, and I don't know if anybody here we actually believe that in two weeks, the data would change to where we wouldn't be wearing masks. Mm -hmm. So I, I think regardless, if we approve this today or not, 
things aren't going to change that much, or if at all, unless somebody makes a motion to rescind the other motion. But that's just my perception on that. Thank you. Okay, other? Yes. Just to clarify, it's actually a motion to postpone, not suspend. Thank you very much. I, I knew there was some language that... Yeah, postpone to October 26th. Okay, you're good with that? The word postpone? Okay, just want to make sure. Yeah. All right, good. Any other comments or questions? I, just, I might be able to say, could, could we give direction if we accept that, that the district carry on as if it, we were going to approve it so they can have their matrix and that? Is that that hard to do? Everything uh, in place? And if uh, in two weeks we then approve it, it's ready to go into operation. Is that possible? I, I, this is my opinion, but unless it's approved, I don't think we give uh, the proper authority to the district to do that. And okay. so I really, I really believe, and I'm, I'm getting nods too from others that that we, we would have to approve it for the district to act on it. That's okay. Hey, thanks. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, seeing uh, no further conversation on that, we're going to need a roll call vote on this, on the amendment to postpone um, the decision on this until October 26th. Do you have another question? I do. I'm sorry. Okay. What are the ramifications that if we postpone to the 25th on actually carrying this out if we decide to do it then? What are the ramifications on timelines? How can, how do we cope with that? I think I think um, Superintendent Pufal was saying that that if we did this, we have another mask mandate that's about to expire, uh -huh. and then but it takes time and and for the district to educate people, okay. and so that's why that's what it, it would. I mean, they could do it in three days, I suppose, but the, his 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 concern was not being able to do it well, so that everybody understands what's going on. That's what. Superintendent Pufal was saying. So you could do it if we postpone till the 25th, then decide to approve it, and you could still have make it work. Yes. Thank you. It will, it will be a little tricky, but we will do the very best we can, like Thank we you. always do. Okay. All right, Commissioner Hayward. All right, because you already have the <coughs> parent letter, and we've already seen drafts of yeah, that. So, like, things are already in place. Right. So I can't yeah, imagine a, a first and the 15th so day. Distribution and people right. to have time to get, you know, into their inbox. Or right, in anticipation of tonight. Right. So I think it should be fine. Okay. All right. Uh, now, so last call. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything else? All right, let's go ahead, and we need to do a roll call vote. Yes, let's, uh, uh, Ms. Jensen, would you, can you repeat the motion for us or re read the motion to us, please? Sure, this is, um, the motion is to amend and postpone the motion on the table until the October 26th meeting. Is that a correct? It wouldn't be a mandate. Just a postponement. Thank you. Thank you. So it's, a, the motion is to postpone the motion on the table till the October 26th meeting. Thank you. Herda? No. Millard? No. Murray? Yes. Paul? No. Ardry? Yes. Dahmershausen? Yes. Hainewall? No. Hayworth? Yes. Myers? No. The, met, the motion fails five to four. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now we go back to the original motion. Any further discussion? Commissioner Murray. Thank you very much. Thank you for making a recommendation. I, I appreciate that very much. Um, I just wanted to well, first, let's. I wrote a couple notes, um, and thanks to all my fellow commissioners. I have so much respect for everybody, and um, 
we all know what kind of issue this is. It's very emotional and split at best, right? Um, but like the two uh, student uh, presenters today said, how many wonderful things are going on and how grateful I am and we are in this community that we're in school. Um, and the kids said that. Um, athletics are going on, right? Uh, girls volleyball tonight at Craig. This past Friday, you and I were at the uh, homecoming game. Craig lost 56 to six, <laughs> but everybody was smiling and having a great time. It's the referee's fault, but <laughs> um, everyone was having a great time. That place was packed, right? Absolutely. Uh, the Arts Academy at Parker with their new play, homecomings going on at both schools with parades, the bands, you know, marching down the street for the homecoming parades. And um, most importantly, our dashboard is reflecting that our staff and students are healthy, that are in school and we all, okay. Um, I just wanted to, the data here about um, the September and October totals, is that a, a cumulative through the year? It's not as, as of today because the dashboards as of today only you know says the numbers are. Right? Yeah, so, so, so the dashboard just reflects the most recent week. Right. These numbers, back here real quickly, thank you. Let's go back to students. These numbers are cumulative, right? Right, so right, okay. Totals for the first it's a the total. six weeks of school through right. yesterday. So as of the 6th, which the district has done a wonderful job keeping these things current as best we can. Right. I mean, the, the, the information is there. Right. But as of today, total of seven, as of the 6th of October, I should say, 17 positive cases throughout the schools and a decline of four, uh, sorry, of three from the staff. So a total of two positive cases after the 16th. Um, okay, so I just wanted to make sure I understood that. Um, I was reading the letter uh, that was prepared for the families and parents or the community. It says on, on here, um, mask use for extracurricular activities, including athletics, clubs, theatrical, and musical performance are addressed under different guidelines. Right. Can you help me? Yep. So we follow that? WIAA guidelines have been since we restarted sports again. Do, do you know what that is? I mean, what is that? That is, um, Right now, kids that are participating in those events uh, don't have to wear a mask, um, but the you know the crowd at the event does. Yes. Okay, and that so I, I assume that's the same for and that's how we're clubs, all, of our, all of our clubs and theater. We're, we're following that same protocol for all okay. all of those activities. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so I took that dashboard data and I made a ratio where it's, it's 14, I, I, 17 minus the three came up with 14 active cases as of that day uh, with, with uh, staff and um, students. And I made a ratio, so I put 14 over 9,500. I uh, estimated 9,500 as a student enrollment. I didn't add in employees, which I should have, but I didn't. And then I had somebody help me with some math. And I, then I wanted to know what that meant over 100,000 people, because that's the ratio we use from the county, correct? So many cases of 100,000 gets you your movement, right? Yep. So if you did that math, that 14 out of 9,500 equals 147 out of 100,000. 
No, I'm not. I'm taking as of October 6th data. Because I'm, I guess, in my opinion, I'm not concerned about what happened in the past. I mean, what's happening now? Because isn't that what the metric or this is telling us? It's over time in the future what we're going to do, not what we did in the past. Right. Well, the right? metric will use the current rolling at current transition. data. What's going on? Okay. So. Oh, yeah. so, and I'm looking at that as it relates to my opinion on the the columns, you know, how we move from low to high, that we only had 14 cases in the school district. And that puts us at 147 at 100,000. How are we ever, based on the metric, gonna get down to low? I mean, it'd have to be two or one person with active COVID. So for example, in Albany, if you look, I look today at the link, you know, Albany is one that's um, in the middle that um, it's recommended, but th because the numbers are based on that ratio of 100,000 person population, that's the ratio. They had one case and that doesn't qualify them to not to wear a mask. Yeah, but with due respect, that's not how that's not how the metric works. Okay. Um, the, the, the the metric is based on the rolling average of data for the county. Right. Not the right. school district. And, and and in fact, if you go back and look at the historical data, we would have been unmasked because we were in blue in Rock County, um, starting in late May and going into late July and early August. That's the only time so far during the pandemic that that is true. Well, that, that's another one of my confusion is we're using Rock County data for this school board member to make a decision about the school right. district of Janesville. Yeah. Right? That's a good question. And so, so thank you. can I respond to that? Or? Please. So please. the data that's reported out is the metric is set up and it's based on, on county level information. Right, and so for us to try to cherry pick out of that, yeah, it, it takes the reliability and the validity out of the transmission data. Okay. In addition to that, we have 11,000, give or take, students and staff who come here every day. How many, how many interactions do you suppose those people have with people from outside of the school district of Janesville? Lots. 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 And so to try to just say it's not a county issue is probably missing the fact that there's a lot of human interaction across school district lines. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up because that's the logic part, right? We're assuming things that a lot of interaction goes on with our students and our staff outside the school district day, right? Mm -hmm. And you and I witnessed that Friday. Right? You look up into the student section. How many kids do you think were there? 300? Yeah. Maybe more? Maybe more. Right? And they're not like distanced. They're like on top of each, literally on top of each other, having a great time. Up and down, going back and forth, a concession. But yet, I'm being asked to tell those kids. Now, this is where I try to reach a compromise few weeks ago with the high school. So in that case, go ahead, have a great time. <clears throat> but then tomorrow morning or Monday when you're in class, you have to wear a mask. See, that's the logic piece that, and then um, there was another, jeez, uh, I don't know how I should say this. Another event that went on, 900 and some kids in one small area experiencing the same thing. But yet, Monday, you gotta wear a mask. So, and again, I'm restating myself, I'm, I'm looking for some compromise at the high school level based on logic and behavior. It just doesn't make any sense that 
in my opinion, this is that I'm telling these high school kids, when you're out in the public, whatever, or even in a school building, don't worry about it until you're in the classroom. So I, it's um, very confusing to me. Um, and then furthermore, I just have one more. Thanks for being patient with me. I appreciate it. Um, the part about incentivizing vaccination. Um, at first, I thought, yeah, you know, that seems to be a logical um, avenue to take to give us or students and staff the opportunity to have an option. But I just don't, and based on the, the numbers we get today, 42%, uh, I just, it, to me, it's unrealistic to assume that we'll get to 80%. So therefore, in my opinion, has no validity. Because I think it's an unreachable goal, so why is it even in there? I just don't see it. It's just my opinion. So I can't, uh, and then, you know, I think, I believe I'm elected to make these decisions and to do it this way, I think in just the way my personality is, and I think others, makes me a, a watchdog on this that I too will be checking this through a microscope and watching this very closely. Is that good or bad? I, I don't know. Um, so I think I've had enough time and shared my thoughts. So I appreciate your time. Thanks. Other thoughts or questions? So I too appreciate that the kids are in school and I know the benefits of that, obviously with two kids in the district right now, but I don't think we can say for sure what will happen if we were to change the mask guidance. That's all speculation and you can find studies and articles in your favor on either side. You can find some in Arizona, you can find some in Whitewater. So I know I've seen this matrix for weeks and Liz, I think it's a great idea you brought it up for us to explore. Um, but in my gut, I cannot support anything that's gonna put us in the position of deciding on a mask for families that it should be their choice, when, especially when Rock County Health Department doesn't even mandate it. We are not epidemiologists and this should be up to their choice. I also feel like it's, um, pushes the vaccine, which again is not our position to do. And, um, you know, looking at the data, Kevin, you mentioned the 17 kids and two staff, there are 9,468 kids. So that's 0.17% of our student population, 1600 staff. So two of those, um, that's 0.13%. So if, if a kid in a classroom has strep throat, we don't take any of this action. We, if they have the flu, we don't take any of this action. This I feel like is all being built up about um, fear that adults have and, and, and opinions and not the kids overall health, which we've seen and heard many stories about what it's doing to these kids. That I feel like is more of a greater, more great of a risk than the, vac the um, infection. And there's numbers to back that up. We did a survey to get input. It told us majority did not want masks. It was a slim majority and we went against it. Again, we're elected to do what the public wants us to do and we didn't do that. In reality, these students, as Kevin mentioned, they're going to games outside on top of each other at Monterey Stadium and having fun and they're just fine. They go to School dances, and I'm telling you, look at pictures. There was no masks. They're just fine. 
They go to dinner parties before and after that at people's houses. They go to church. They go to Woodman's. They go to the movies. They go to restaurants. And they're not masked. So they don't have to be. And if, they, if people want to be and have a reason to, that we aren't at all saying they can't be. We're just saying, I'm saying, it's not our position to make that choice for people. So I will not support um, any measure um, that this board wants to take on making that choice for people. Kathy, I just want to break in. We lost video. We have audio. Okay. Um, so they can hear in the lobby. However, we've lost the live stream. Okay. So it's your decision. They're working on it? All right. Okay. So uh, because we have audio, well, I suppose we can continue to, we can proceed. So um, I'm, I'm going to weigh in on this for a second since I've got the mic right in front of me and it's open. Um, so um, I believe masks work. I believe that our low numbers is the goal, and the masks are contributing to that. And so this, our, our conversation about whether to accept the rubric or not is kind of devolved into the mask mandate uh, or the, or the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, effectiveness of masks. And I'm, I'm just, I believe the um, science on it. I believe that... Um, Health and safety is got to be a pri priority to of our students, um, and I believe I also believe that their interactions outside of the classroom is another reason why we need to mask because they're bringing in stuff or potentially bringing in stuff to our classrooms that will affect all those other kids that weren't there, and then their families. So that's my reason for that. My reason for supporting this. Um, metric here kind of goes uh, um, to my to my experience teaching. And so I remember when I was a student, I remember one assignment in particular that I thought was I did a great job on. I mean, like way over and above. And I came back and it said B. What does that mean? Okay, well, the narrative of it is that it means it's above average. Well, what does that mean? Nobody really could explain to me, and teachers certainly couldn't explain to me exactly what that meant. And I, I see this. The first, my first in, impression of this was that this is like the rubrics that we use in teaching. So if a student earns a B in my classroom, I say, and they want to know why, I say, well, let's look at the rubric, okay? On the essay that you wrote, uh, your thesis um, was really good. So you got all the points on, on thesis statement. Uh, your support was lacking, you know, here and here. And that's why the score um, was lower on the support. Maybe the essay lacked some organization um, and there's, it's all des described. And so that's why organization uh, score was lower. And then it all contributed at the end to um, a, a number that equals B. B is defined. And students actually get feedback on that. And so I guess that's what I really, that's what, why I appreciate this is because to me, this is, this is like a rubric to me. It's like a definition and explanation and clarity. So we were getting, you know, we get um, narratives from um, the CDC and the, and the, and the health department and everything else, but um, but to me, it's not, and it's helpful, of course, but it is not necessarily as, as clear to me. And I just think that this is an incredibly effective way of communicating with our parents about, um, about the direction things are going, hopefully down, um, and, uh, and how we will respond. So that's, that's why I'm going to support this metric. Any other questions or comments? Kathy? Yes. Oh. oh, I forgot. Sorry. Commissioner Hanawall. Yes. Um, I think, you know, when we, as, as several people have pointed out, our goal is to continue to have our students in class, keep our classes open, have them participating in extracurricular activities as 
cetera, et cetera. I think we've been able to do that because we have put in place a mask mandate. Um, there's a great quote from a movie called The Great Debaters that says, we do what we have to so that we can do what we want to. We want to start school open. We want to try to start in extracurricular activities. We want to keep everyone healthy and safe. So we have to have a mask mandate as per the CDC, public health, etc. This metric gives us the ability to look at guidelines or actual numbers so that all of us stop guessing when is it going to come to an end? When are we going to put a mask mandate in place? When are we going to remove it? I think there's a lot of thought that's gone into this. This is not something that has been matched up overnight. I know that you know there are several other districts in the state of Wisconsin that are using this, and this was asked for at several meetings ago. So that's why I'm going to support this, and I think it's a good idea if we move on this as soon as possible so that it takes away the constant debate of how long you're going to keep it, do we want to continue to put it on mass mandate in place, when are we going to get rid of it, to give the clear definition as to how this is going to continue to play out in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hanawal. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Commissioner Murray. I just want to clarify then the, the standing motion that mandates masks until the 26th. So after the 26th meeting then that expires and then this, if this passes, this goes into effect the 29th. So what happens between, is it a weekend? Yeah, so the current the current motion goes through the 28th. Thank you. Right, so yeah, there's no gap there. So thank, thank you for you. checking that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So that's what happens. One expires, one takes over without a, any sort of action. Nope. The action's tonight. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, I just want to thank Mr. Pupo for your time. That I know that you've spent a considerable amount of time on this metric. Um, and I also want everyone to know that I greatly respect all sides of this. This is a very difficult place to be for all of us. Um, the school district of Janesville didn't manufacture COVID-19. This is here and we have to do our best to navigate. Um, my goal is not to stay in a mask forever. I think we want to compromise, and this metric allows us a very clear path forward out of masks. And that's what I like about it. I hope that the people that are angry that we're considering a metric can appreciate that this is an opportunity for us to move forward in a clear pathway. And I appreciate that considerably because I ultimately that's my goal. Thank you, Commissioner Paul. Anybody else? What was it? Oh, Kevin, your mic is on. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay, we'll see no further comment or questions. Um, this will have to be a roll call vote as well. So um, the motion is to accept the metric. Uh, I, I don't know if I could say it better than that. There it is, the motion up there, approving the metric October 29th. Is that the motion, Jim, that you wanted to make? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Do you want me to reread it? Yes, please. Okay. Here it is, too. The motion on the table is to approve the mask metric and process as presented effective October 29th, 2021 for all employees, students, guests, invitees, and all other persons who may be present within any school district of Janesville buildings subject to the following exceptions. Children under five years of age, 
persons who fall into the CDC's control and prevention guidelines for those who should not wear face coverings due to medical conditions, mental health conditions, developmental disabilities, or are otherwise covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and persons who have upper respiratory chronic conditions and silent disabilities. Is that what you? That's what I meant to say. <laughs> Thank you. Are we ready for the roll call vote? I believe we are. Commissioner Dommershausen? Yeah, I just want to add one thing. Uh, I want to remind, as I said before, masks are not the only option. Uh, shields are also an option, although not as good as a mask. I wish people would consider them. I see some people wearing them out, out in public, and I commend them for it. Thank you. Okay, but the motion is about masks. Correct. Yes. Okay. Okay, I think we're ready to vote. Millard? Yes. Murray? No. Paul? Yes. Audrey? No. Dommershausen? Yes. Hainewall? Yes. Hayworth? No. Herda? Yes. Myers? Yes. The motion passes 6-3. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks that was everybody. a hard vote. Yep. It was Thanks a good conversation, though. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, next on our agenda is our report about uh, finance buildings and grounds. Commissioner Ardry. Hard to be lively after that one. <laughs> <laughs> but we did have a lively one-hour meeting. Um, really, and it was focused on the publishing of the budget. Um, we wanted to make sure as a finance committee we had an opportunity to take a look and one of the biggest items, and hopefully as a board and as a public, you'll take time to actually review um, the video because we walked through the publication in uh, great detail. Um, it was simple to understand, but really the, the main purpose, at least that I had as walking through that is, as a taxpayer, what What's the impact of this line item or this particular fund? Where is my money, where are my tax dollars going with respect to that? Um, so we walked through that, as I said, in a great amount of detail. And that was the, that was our meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Commissioner Ardry? All right. Thank you again. Thank you for all your work. It's, uh, it's amazing. It's amazing how much work that committee does. Okay, um, I have no cur current current um, board requests. We have some there in the hopper and some that we've that we're reviewing and uh, and so, but I have no um, other board requests at this moment. Um, future meeting dates and times and agenda items. Um, let's see here. Question, Kathy. Yes. Go ahead. I, I have a question. Where, is Mike still there? Yeah. <laughs> I have a, I have a, how do I, or is it, am I out of line to ask a question about the motion we just passed? Is it too late to? I would say it's too late since we moved on in the agenda. Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, we have a, a public hearing um, on the proposed district budget next uh, at our next meeting, which is October 26th at 6 p.m. here at the Educational Services Center. We have a benefits committee meeting on Thursday the 28th at 9.30 in the morning, at, again, here at the ESC. And then we have a, a PPC meeting on Monday, November 1st at 4.30, again, here at the PPC. Anything else? I don't see the 10:26. Oh, thank you for catching that. Okay. All right. Um, we have reached the end of our agenda. Thank you very much, all. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I needed one more at the very end there, Jim. Thank you, Commissioner Hanawal.